Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And today, I'm bringing you a discussion about hell and God's wrath. Have you ever been told that hell is simply just the consequences of the bad choices we make here on earth, that it's not a real place. It's not a place of punishment that God would send anyone. Have you heard that? Have you heard that a God who has wrath couldn't be a good God? Well, we're going to talk about these topics today with my friend Joshua Ryan Butler. So a few years ago, Josh wrote a book called The Skeletons in God's Closet, The Mercy of Hell, The Surprise of Judgment, and The Hope of of Holy War. How's that for a title? I read this book a few years ago when I was researching and writing my book, Another Gospel, and I found it very helpful because Josh brought in some very important insights as it relates to things like hell and God's wrath and even heaven. And at the same time, when I was finished with the book, I had some lingering questions. I remember thinking, I'd really love to meet this author someday and ask some of these questions that I didn't feel like he fully settled in the book. Well, I got that opportunity a few months ago when Josh and I were speaking at the same event. I loved his answers, and I invited him to come on the podcast to discuss this topic with me today. So Josh is the pastor of local and global outreach at Imago Dei Community in Portland, Oregon, and he's written the book, The Skeletons in God's Closet. He's also coming out uh, with a book on sexuality that we are going to talk about as well in the coming months. But uh, I want to let you guys know before I bring you to this conversation about some fun things happening. So, you know, I've talked about the unshaken conference. This is a conference that was birthed from some conversations I had with my friend Natasha Crane about how we might be able to equip Christians who may not be drawn to a typical apologetics conference that might be over their heads, but how can we break down some really basic ideas and help people understand what's going on in culture and really give them practical tools to live their Christian faith boldly in an increasingly chaotic culture? Well, we had our first Unshaken conference in Dayton, Ohio last month, and it was amazing. It exceeded our expectations. Everyone left encouraged, including us speakers. And so I'm really excited to let you know that the next event on May 6th will be at Calvary Chapel Chino Hills in Southern California. So if you're in the Southern California area, please come out and join us. Tickets are on sale right now. You can go to unshakenconference.com to register for Chino Hills. And we would so love to see you come out for this amazing event that we are really, really excited about. Don't forget to subscribe to the Unshaken Faith podcast, where Natasha and I just bring you little bite-sized 15-minute weekly nuggets nuggets to help equip you to live your Christian faith boldly in this chaotic culture. We've had some great responses on past episodes where we've broken down uh, TikToks about original sin. We've talked about the He Gets Us campaign. We've talked about multiple questions that people gave us at the Unshaken conference that we didn't get to live, so we answered those in a podcast. We talked about the American Girl book, the body image book that's promoting transgender ideology to young girls. So we tackle the big topics on that podcast. So definitely check that out. And without any further ado, here's Josh Butler. Well, Josh, it is so great to finally get you on the podcast. I've actually wanted to have you on for at least two or three years. Uh, so back when I was researching for my chapter on hell for my book, Another Gospel, which came out in 2019, I read your book, uh, Skeleton in God's Closet, and I found it really, really helpful. And I, I shared this with you that I read through the book and I thought the way that you had framed it was so helpful, especially to for people who have an existential problem with hell, you know, and, and I think most Christians probably do. I mean, the thought that God would send somebody to a place called hell, whatever we think hell is, um, is, is something that causes a lot of existential angst and for good reason, right? And so when I read your book, I remember loving it, but thinking, I do have a few more questions that I would want to ask him if I ever got to meet him, right? And then we did get to meet. We got to have dinner together when we were uh, with some other speakers when we were speaking together at a conference. And um, I got to ask you my extra questions, and I loved all your answers. And I thought, man, let's have Josh on to talk about hell, um, because I do think your book, Skeleton in God's Closet, is a great resource to give to people who um, just have that, that sort of real emotional and inner struggle with the concept of hell. So welcome, Josh. Thanks so much for being willing to take on this tough topic today. 
Well, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be here. I've loved listening to your podcast from time to time. I'll drop in and just have really loved a uh, number of episodes that I've jumped in on. It's always been, oh, this is such a great conversation. And it was great meeting recently and uh, getting the chance to have this conversation now. Yeah. So, all right. Well, let's let's get started with sort of what led you to become interested in writing on the topic of hell. You know, we not many people grow up and say, I want to be a theologian who talks about hell and then difficult topics like God's wrath. We're going to talk a little bit about God's wrath here today, too. But how did you end up writing this and what, what led you here? Definitely. Well, you know, so I was in college and I really had this encounter with Jesus. That was where Jesus kind of got a hold of my life. And I remember coming back to my dorm room and telling my roommate, like, oh, my gosh, you'll never believe it. Like, God is so good. And it's just so amazing. And here's who Jesus is. Here's what he's done. And uh, he listened. And then his first response back to me was, so you think I'm going to hell now? <laughs> and I found, mm -hmm. like, for me, I think it's for many people, um, I wasn't necessarily thinking about hell. I wasn't wanting to necessarily talk about it. But it was a question that my, many of my friends had, uh, family members and people that I loved and cared about. And so... Uh, probably caring for them, I began to wrestle with it too. And over the years, kind of going, God, what do you have to say about this? How do I make sense of it? And as I jumped into reading the Bible for myself and really like studying Christian theology, like asking good questions of mentors and learning, uh, what I began to become convinced of was that many of the pictures that many of my friends had and, and maybe prominent in our culture were actually caricatures of what uh, mm. We actually see happening what the Bible is teaching and what kind of a robust historic Christian theology would proclaim. And I found myself, you know, I kind of get into this book, but I was working internationally in areas where there had been like sex trafficking and genocide and just some of the most horrific things you can imagine. And I actually found these doctrines really powerful, actually mm. powerful at proclaiming the goodness of God and our need for his justice and our need for him to come and set things right. And so um, so I think two goals for me, one was wanting to help people who kind of had this caricature of who God is because of how to gain a yeah. greater confidence in the goodness of God, like not in spite of these topics, but even because of them. Mm -hmm. And the other one too, was to help demonstrate how I think these are actually really relevant to some of the biggest, most pressing challenges facing us in our world today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I share this in my book, how growing up, I admit, I think I had some really bad ideas of hell. And I talk about the traveling church play that came to my church when I was in uh, high school, or maybe it was I was after just after high school. And it wasn't all bad. I remember just being really emotionally stirred, you know, thinking about God and heaven and Jesus and being with Jesus forever. So, you know, it wasn't like all bad. But there were definitely these caricatures where like the devil is like the mayor of hell, like it's his hometown and he's in charge and he's having fun and he can't wait to, to drag all the people with him when in reality, you know, the, the well, I don't want to give too much away because we're going to get into the nature of hell in a little while. But I had some of these sort of misconceptions that God is just, you know, so excited to torment people and just almost like he's a sadist or something like that. And so I think there are some really unhelpful ideas out there that people might be thinking about when they are talking about hell, which is is why I think the framing that you offered in your book is so helpful. Um, so talk about when, when you were telling your story and you said you realized your friends had some of these characters, caricatures, one of those caricatures uh, you talk about is the storyline heaven and hell fit into. So um, talk about that. What is that storyline? And then maybe how does that kind of come against some of the caricatures that even I think, you know, Christians might even have? Definitely. No, that's great. Yeah, we have to ask, what is the broader storyline? What is the biblical story that this tough topic of health fits into? And what I found is the caricature. I think many people have what I would call like the up-down storyline, right? Like like mm -hmm. when I die, I live on earth, and when I'm going to die, and when I die, I'll either go up to heaven or down to hell, right? And that's sort of the end game. And uh, there's a couple of challenges, problems with that story I get into in the book. But uh, biggest one I'd focus on here is to say that heaven and hell kind of become like these two co-equal competing counterparts, uh, right? Who are vying for our eternal destiny. So one's on the positive side of the battery, other's negative side of the battery, like one's yin, the other's yang, whatever, right? That's kind of this mindset I think many people in our culture have. Um, but the reality is the Bible doesn't depict heaven and hell. It talks about both, but it doesn't talk about them the same way. And there's actually an interesting uh, experiment I give people to kind of show this, you know, like if you go to say like Bible Gateway or an online Bible and you type in heaven, hell into the search feature, it's going to show you how many times the words heaven and hell appear together uh, in the same verse. Bible. 
And the way that, you know, when I ask people, how many do you expect? Many people will say like, oh, maybe a couple hundred, you know, and they're often shocked to find that the answer is zero. Um, that there are no verses in the Bible where heaven and hell appear together with each other, kind of like the same phrase, the way we use it today. And that should be shocking because we tend to talk about them always together as this pair, you know, heaven and hell, heaven and hell. Um, now, heaven shows up in the Bible, hell shows up, but I would suggest the Bible has a different way of framing their relationship. Mm -hmm. And heaven does have a counterpart in the Bible, only it's not hell. And if we use a different uh, version of that experiment, we can find out what it is. And so if we type in heaven and earth into the search bar, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what we discovered is that around 200 times in the biblical storyline, heaven and earth appear together as this complementary pair of this counterpart, uh, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, the storyline of heaven and earth is like this thread woven through the biblical story. And so I would suggest that often we get hell wrong because we get heaven and earth mm. wrong and we bigger storyline of heaven and earth in place, the smaller subtopic of hell starts to make more sense. And so what is that storyline? Well, in short, I'd say that it has kind of three major movements, that heaven and earth are both created by God, they're torn by sin, but they're destined for reconciliation, right? Like they're mm -hmm. created by God, God creates a good heavens and good earth, but then they are torn by sin, like the destructive power of sin and death and hell, like our invaders and God's good creation has good intentions for his world. And yet because God is good, he is on a mission to reconcile heaven and earth, to bring back together what the power of hell has torn apart. And so Colossians 1, we see Paul talk about um, that God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile all things in heaven and on earth by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Mm -hmm. And what Paul's saying there is that the end game of the cross, the center of the Christian faith, Jesus's work on the cross is he's the savior who reconciles heaven and earth who brings back together what hell has torn apart. I love when Jesus is raised from the dead and he tells his disciples in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he doesn't say all authority in heaven, so I'll see you when you get there. He says, no, all authority in heaven and over the earth has been entrusted to Christ. And why has the father given his son this authority? Well, Ephesians 1 would say it's to bring all things together under one head, even Christ. Uh, so God is on a mission to reconcile heaven and earth. That's the end of the biblical story. We see in Revelation 21, 22, where uh, God is bringing the new Jerusalem, the city of God, down out uh, from heaven to earth to reconcile heaven and earth. And so God is on a mission to reconcile heaven and earth. And I'd suggest it's here that the smaller subtopic of hell starts to make more sense. Mm -hmm. Because to long for the dawning of the light is by its very nature to long for the banishing of darkness. Right? Like to hope for the healing of the body, it's implicitly to hope for the excising out of the disease. Uh, for us to pray with Jesus, God, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, is by its very nature to pray that all those powers and people who stand unrepentantly opposed to God's kingdom would no longer be able to hurt and destroy and unleash destruction. Right? And so we can say from one angle, God is on a mission to reconcile heaven and earth. But I'd suggest from another angle, we can see the very same thing in another way, which is that God is on a mission to get the hell out of earth. Right? Like yeah. if we have a God who is on a mission to get the hell out of earth, to actually uh, get the destructive power of hell on both these kind of systemic, international, I don't know, it's a little right. I mean, it just in the broad sense of like these big um, things like genocide, trafficking, war, things that are just horrible, but also God is on a mission to get the hell out of earth on a very personal level in our own lives, the destructive, wicked spark and flame of mm -hmm. our own pride and lust and rage and greed and these vices that we all struggle with. Those are the sparks that set God's good world aflame. And so it's because of God's goodness, his good desire and mission to reconcile heaven and earth that gives rise to his standing against and working towards the removal of the destructive power of hell and ultimately containing that destructive power in uh, more the, the future, like where, where hell is going.
Yeah. Okay. So many directions I want to go right now. That was a beautiful foundation to lay to kind of springboard into some other topics. I definitely think this is a good place to possibly bring in the concept of, you know, sin and God's wrath towards sin and what that looks like. But before we go there, just as you were talking, I sort of thought of this analogy and I'd like to know what you think about it. If you could give some comments on it. I think, you know, the caricatures we might have about hell could include things like, uh, you know, if I walk down the aisle for an altar call and I write my name on a card or I pray a magic prayer, that means I get to just buzz off to heaven when I die and leave this earth and whatever happens to the earth, whatever, I'm just going to buzz off to heaven anyway. And that's that's a wrong way to look at it, because when you really see the biblical you know, narrative, you see that it's this heaven and earth and, and God restoring his good creation. He's making all things new. Um, so the, the analogy could be sort of like um, like it, like a disease. You mentioned the word disease. So imagine if there's um, a beautiful place, just a, a beautiful place where people, um, a contagion gets introduced and infects the, the whole population, everybody, but then there, there comes a cure. So there's a cure available, but not everybody wants to take the cure. They're, they're, maybe they've gotten used to the disease and they, they en maybe enjoy temporally the effects of some of the things the disease offers them or whatever. And so uh, after many, many, many millennia of... <laughs> trying to get people to take the cure so that they can be restored to their original purpose and their um, their right state, at some point, there there has to be a quarantine, right? There has to be a time when you say, okay, if you're not going to take the cure, then you are going to have to go into the quarantine that, uh, you know, was not intended for you originally. But but if, if you're going to infect others who have taken the cure or whatever, you're going to have to go into a quarantine. And, and in that sense, hell is kind of like a quarantine. Um, now, there's more to it, of course. There's, there is the punishment aspect of hell, which we can, we're going to talk about. But just at its base level to help us begin to understand what do you think of that analogy and what would you add to it or delete from it <laughs> yes yeah, so i love that analogy on, on a couple fronts one is uh like you mentioned well with the medicine and kind of the disease metaphor you know i, I think one of the phrases i use in the book is that christ is the great physician and his yeah. question to us is not are you good enough to get into my kingdom but his mm. question is rather will you let me heal you you know yes. like that christ um, and his posture towards us through the cross is to take the weight of sin, death, and hell on our behalf in order that we could be healed and restored. Uh, but if we say no, you know, like if we refuse the antidote, as you mentioned, you know, like then I, then, then the, the mercy of God is to protect the flourishing of his kingdom, to protect his reconciled humanity from the invasive power of sin through quarantine. Or I think of how one friend of mine put it, uh, hell, it's like a, a Tupperware container for evil. <laughs> you know, it's like something to kind of yeah, keep yeah. it so they can no longer infect and destroy. And so that image of containment, you know, one, one of the things to get into the book is the idea that um, one angle on this is that God's purpose is protection. Like he's actually yeah. protecting his kingdom from the destructive power of sin. And so we see this in places like, I think like in Isaiah, where uh, the famous verse where God says, on that day, like when I establish my kingdom on Mount Zion, no longer will they hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. Mm. And the holy mountain is Zion or the new Jerusalem. It's, it's God's kingdom. And God's going, when I establish my kingdom, I'm going to protect it so that they will no longer be able to hurt or destroy. Or there's another uh, beautiful passage uh, in, oh my gosh, in Zechariah or Zephaniah. It's, it's been a little bit, so I'm, I'm yeah, spacing yeah. exactly. Where he says, he's looking forward to the day again, where God's going to establish his kingdom. And God says, on that day, my city will be a city without walls. And uh, because of the great number of people and animals in it. And if you live in that day, you'd be going, oh, that's awesome. Okay, God, that's great. You want to tear down the walls, let everyone who wants to come be a part of your kingdom in, you know. But uh, it would raise a big question of going, well, God, the walls are there to keep the invaders out, right? You know, like if, if the walls go down, then what's going to protect us? And God goes on to say, I myself will be a wall of fire around it, and I will be its glory within. It's like the picture there is God's going, man, yeah, I'm, I'm knocking down the walls to fit, like, the, the people who are becoming a part of my kingdom, my, my restored, reconciled humanity, but I myself will be the wall of fire protect that protects it from those who refuse to be submit to the authority of me as king and to yeah. align their lives with the ways of my kingdom. Like I'm going to protect it from that will no longer be able to wreak havoc in my good kingdom. And so there is this picture, I think, of God protecting uh, his kingdom by containing sin 
uh, unrepentant sin and those who are unrepentantly, uh, you know, uh, opposed to his kingdom and handed over to their sin. And there's this picture of containment or quarantine that I think is a really powerful analogy. And I wonder, too, if uh, part of the misunderstanding or the char- the false caricatures of hell are also, and you, you kind of alluded to this in your initial comments there, is that there's also this caricature we have of heaven sometimes. And I, I know, I think I had this too, you know, sitting on a cloud with a harp, and it's all very sterile and boring. Or uh, somebody might think heaven is just you know, hedonistic pleasure. You know, I think that a lot of atheists or or skeptics, when they say, oh, you're good, God would send people to hell. One of my first initial questions is always like, well, why would you want to go to heaven if you rightly understand what it is? Because it's not just hedonistic pleasure. It's actually like God fully revealed, which if you don't like God and his ways and his authority on this earth, you would actually really hate heaven if you love your sin, right? So I wonder if you have any comments on that. Like, what? how much weight do you think that has in the conversation, just this this misunderstanding of what heaven even is by nature? Definitely, yeah. The the, the misunderstanding that people have, you know, like you, you mentioned, that this is kind of the, the floating in the clouds. Um, and one of the ways I, I talk about this, too, is when I use that phrase, God's on a mission to get the hell out of earth, uh, one of the things that's kind of funny about it is like it can be taken two ways, either in sort of the caricature story or the gospel story, but it means very different things. So in the caricature story, it means that God is on a mission to get us the hell out of Earth, right? Like there's kind of this sense <laughs> yeah. of like, Earth is a mess, like let's get out of Dodge, throw this thing in the wastebasket and let's whisk you guys up, beam me up, Scotty, get me out <laughs> of here. And so that can be kind of an escapist storyline that's like, oh man, God doesn't really care about his creation. He's just kind of whisking us away um and yeah and and it can lead to a mentality of just sort of like heaven looks kind of boring like it's just our soul and we're playing harps in the clouds or whatever but the biblical storyline i suggest is actually that god is on a mission to get the hell out of us on earth right like that god's mission is actually to reconcile creation to himself by dealing with the sin and us as image bearers that is kind of at the root of what's gone wrong in the world you know and so God's committed to us and to his creation. And that it displays his goodness and the hope of, um, and it's, he's, we can see his goodness in his patience with the world right now, even as messed up as it is. But we can also see his goodness and that his patience will not last forever, that it, he will come to set things right and to restore. And so uh, that requires him dealing with the presence of, sin and death and evil and things that wreak havoc in our world today. Yeah, that's good. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about wrath because these topics are intertwined, right? God, the Bible describes from Old Testament all the way through the New as God having wrath and the object of his wrath is sin. Of course, you can't separate sin from the people who commit the sins because in that sense, um, sin is kind of like rust on a car. It, it really doesn't exist unless there's a moral agent committing the sin, right? And, um, or maybe you would have more nuance for that, but talk about wrath. Give us a working definition of what God's wrath is, because I'll tell you, and I've, I think I've shared this on the podcast before, I was talking about wrath at a conference once, and this sweet woman came up to me afterwards and just in tears, and she said, I really struggle with what you were talking about. And and I asked her a few questions, and then she went on to articulate that as a child, she had a very, what she described as a wrathful father, who was, a, he was an alcoholic, and he would fly off into a drunken rage whenever she would just do the slightest little thing, even times that she wasn't guilty of anything. And so her entire understanding of what I was talking about was wrapped up in the context of her alcoholic father. So maybe you can help us untangle some of those knots. Give us a definition of what God's wrath actually is. William Lane Craig was on this podcast and he, I can't remember which theologian he was quoting, but he said, God's wrath is our only hope. And I have never forgotten that. I thought that was so good when we rightly understand it. So help us understand the wrath of God. That's great. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, for many people, the challenge is they have this kind of dichotomy of like, oh, sometimes God's loving, sometimes God's wrathful, mm-hmm. and, and it can feel like these competing tendencies in God, you know? And it's first, I think, helpful to name that, as you mentioned, for the person that you had talked with, and, and that was sort of their experience, uh, perception of God. And when that's actually 
uh, the historic Christian faith says no, like God doesn't have competing parts in him that are competing for whatever, you know? And so, um, and so if I were to just kind of give my, right out of the gate, my, my definition, I would say that God's wrath is the expression of his holy loving character against sin, right? Like it is, it flows from his love. It flows from his holy, it flows from who he is. It's not the separate kind of competing part of God's character. And it's actually bound up with the goodness of God. So uh, I, I love there's a quote. So in my book, The Pursuing God, I have a whole section on, on wrath in there. But there's a quote I love from a guy named Miroslav Volf. And he's a theologian who grew up in the former Yugoslavia and endured like ordering, you know, potentially like some have called it genocidal, you know, like so just horrible conflict. And he saw just horrific things that he describes and names that um, I won't go into it here, but just it breaks your heart. And he has this comment where he says, you know, I used to rebel against the idea of a God of wrath, thinking that uh, that was contradictory to his love. But when I begin to see was how could a God who loves me, who loves our world, not be wrathful against the sin and things that are ravaging my homeland, my community, the world all around me that could not have wrath against the things like the genocide in Rwanda, when we really stare some of those most horrible things in the world, it's like, yeah, I don't think we want a God who is distant and unconcerned or just, oh, I just love it. You know, like, yeah, I just forgive everyone on, and love everyone. And yeah, yeah. Yes. And I love, there's a quote, I think it was D.H. Whiteley said, you know, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Mm. You know? And I think one of the challenges, many people who want to get rid of the wrath of God often want an indifferent God, maybe not that's not what they're thinking. But at the end of the day, it's like a God who's, ah, those people are going to be the way they are, you know? And the reality is it's because God loves his world that the sin that alienates us from him and that destroys human relationships and community that fractures, like I think of James talks about sin as like a, like our tongue, like a spark that can set his world aflame. And it's because God loves his world that he is set against our sin that tears apart his world. And so yeah. his wrath, flows from his love rather than uh, something separate from it. Today's episode is sponsored by our friends at Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers is a home meat delivery service where you can get good quality seafood, pasture-raised chicken, and grass-fed beef. There's no hormones, antibiotics, none of the bad stuff. And for years, I've really wanted to buy good grass-fed beef for my family. I've sought it out. I've even bought it at the really pricey, high-end health food stores and paid that uh, that upcharge for that grass-fed beef. But I didn't know at the time that 85% of grass-fed beef that you buy in the stores today are imported from overseas. Well, what I love about Good Ranchers is that all of the meat is grown on American farms. So this benefits American companies. Also, what I love about Good Ranchers is that they're Christians. They're not giving your money that you paid for their product with to woke charities or to ide ideological charities that are doing harm in our culture. So I really like that about them too. I love that their chicken is triple trimmed. If you don't know what that means, you just have to experience it. You know, you go to the store, you buy the chicken, and it's got that weird veiny stuff and the little wiggly stuff in the middle. None of that's on there. They triple trim it, and it is so good, especially if you just like season it and fry it in a skillet all by itself. It's so, so good. So if you want to get $30 off any box you buy in February, go to goodranchers.com slash Alisa. Use the code Alisa to get $30 off any box you buy in February. That's goodranchers.com slash Alisa. I, I have that uh, Miroslav Volf quote in my book, Another Gospel. I put that in there because I always found that to be such a helpful quote to help people really understand. And I think another practical way I try to help people understand God's wrath is if somebody sort of bucks against the idea that God would have wrath for sin— you know, the, the, the way I would almost respond sometimes is to be like, well, let's, let's think about it and then describe some sort of horrific evil and be like, don't you have wrath for that? Like, aren't, doesn't that make you righteously angry? Isn't that, wouldn't it be right and good to be angry at the person who committed those things and at the act that they committed? Um, and wouldn't it actually be a sign that something's wrong if you were indifferent to that horrific act? And I think that's the kind of stuff that can help people understand it in a, 
practical way. One of the practical ways you help people understand it is with an example of a fish out of water. I mean, you've, deb I don't know if my audience knows this, but you've debated this topic. You've debated with Brian Zond, who we've talked a lot about on the podcast and interacted with some of his work. So talk about the, the fish out of water uh, analogy and, and help us understand God's wrath uh, through that. Great. Yeah, I find the fish out of water analogy helpful to talk about kind of the active and passive sides of God's wrath. So uh, this was actually in one of these debates with him. You know, I had someone uh, confront me uh, with kind of this analogy. And, and so he was saying, um, well, let's say you're a fish. And one day you said, I don't want to live in the water anymore. I want to go up and see what life is like on the dock. So you flop out of the water and you're, you're up on the dock. And at first it's fun. It's like, oh, this is new. This is interesting. And then before long, though, you're kind of uncomfortable. And then you're flopping around and, and you're in misery. You know, you're needing uh, help and you're, you're flopping around suffering on the stock. He said, is that a consequence of the fish's action or is that a punishment? You know, and he's mm. kind of, is that a natural consequence mm -hmm. or a punishment? And he was going, oh, it's obviously it's a consequence, not a punishment. A punishment would be somebody walking down the pier with a stick and beating the fish, right? And uh, and so he was using that to kind of say, he's like, God's wrath in the Bible, it's just him handing us over to letting us jump out of the water, so to speak, right? Let us live our lives our own ways, our own terms, and, and suffer the natural consequences of that. Um, and he was confronting, he had a hard time with the idea of God's punishment around and my response was like, I, I get what you're saying with the analogy, but here's the thing in the Bible, that fish flopping around on the dock is both a consequence and a punishment at mm -hmm. the same time, right? Uh, that, and here's, here's kind of the gist that in the Bible, we see the creator has ordered creation such that the fish thrives in the water and doesn't do good on the dock, right? right. So he's thrived us to, he's ordered creation such that we thrive in his presence and life with him. And, uh, and man, when we rebel and reject it and go away from him, you know, like that leads to destruction downstream. And because God is creator upholding creation that he is executing his just judgment upon the fish, you could say, you know, from one angle, the fish is receiving the consequence of its actions, what it deserves. But from another angle, God is, uh, executing his just judgment upon that fish by sustaining and upholding it in that condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we see this language in scripture where God's agency is described as kind of both and like both him handing over and him actively judging. Uh, I think Romans one is a famous one where it says, you know, and God handed them over, handed them over three times. He gave them over. Um, and yet God is depicted in that passage as that is the sign of his wrath is actually handing over. And yet, um, yeah, that's, it, it's, it's both active and passive. We see this in a lot of different, uh, places in scripture. You know, a few that, um, come to mind just immediately is, uh, the exile for Israel in the old Testament. From the one hand, the exile was depicted as kind of passive. Like there was a sense of God, um, his glory departed the temple in Ezekiel. He kind of left the, left the house as we left the land. And without his protective presence, Babylon came in and invaded. And it looked like, okay, God handed Israel over to destruction. He kind of took his hand off the driver's wheel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then from another angle, the prophets all over the place are going, God sent Babylon as his avenging sword his, to execute his judgment upon his people, a sign of his wrath. And so God is seen in the very same event as both handing over and executing judgment as both taking his hand off the steering wheel in a sense and still being the one driving the car. And so uh, I know that can mess with our minds a little bit. It's just like, whoa, how is that? How is that working? But I think the key distinction to keep in mind that Christian theology has historically pointed us to is that God is creator, not creation. And so mm -hmm. God is distinct from his creation as creator, which means that his agency works different from ours. He's both the author over the story and an actor in the story, right, in Christ. But um, yeah, so so if that makes sense, yeah. It that does, I, I it does. No, yeah, I think this is good. Yeah, but and maybe just is... the challenge is I think sometimes where people get wrong is they want to take that both end and turn it into an either or. You know? and we That's need to right. Keep those, you know, and that's really side. key because I think it's also indicative of as sinful humans to make it all about 
its effects on us. You know, it could be almost existentially comforting to say, well, it's really not God punishing you. It's just you, him allowing you to experience the, uh, the, the consequences of your bad choices or your sin. And, and certainly that is present. Like you mentioned, it's not, it's not an either or, it's a both and. But even, you know, as Christians, we really should get our language from the Bible on these things. And even Jesus referred to hell as everlasting punishment. That's the word he uses. And I know that uh, in progressive Christianity, there's there's a lot of kind of hermeneutical dancing to try to make it not be that. But if just if you're just reading through the Bible, it's very evident that there is a punishment element to it. And I think we often, you know, see this also just with the concept of sin, right? I think it well-meaning Christians, certainly not saying they're meaning to deceive, but well-meaning Christians will almost make sin and the reason you shouldn't sin really all about you. It's be, well, God doesn't want you to sin because it's going to hurt you. And that is true. This is not an either or. It's a both and. Your sin will corrupt you from the inside out. I think it was Jay Sklar, the uh, famous uh, scholar who wrote a uh, commentary on Leviticus, who said sin is an acid that mars and distorts and destroys everything it touches. So there is certainly the element that sin hurts you. But there is also the element we forget sometimes when we pull the punch on, and that's that sin is active rebellion against a holy God. You know, because God has wrath for sin, and it's rooted in his holiness. It's because he can have no unity with sin. So it's, I think it's important to think deeply about these topics and not just sort of simplify them down to one thing. It's just, it's just bad for you. God doesn't want you to be hurt. And certainly he doesn't. Um, but, but there is that both and tension that we have to live in when it comes to something like the, the nature of sin and the nature of God's wrath. So, yes. um, all right. So let's, uh, now that we've kind of laid the foundation for how to think properly about what hell is, what, what earth is, what heaven is, um, and we've talked a little bit about why God's angry at sin, righteous, righteously angry. In fact, it would be um, against his character to not be righteously angry at things that corrupt his good creation and um, are out of alignment with his nature and character, which is uh, perfect. So let's talk about where does it go? Where is hell? Like is hell, uh, so in many progressive Christian books, they'll, they'll say, well, hell is a real play, a real reality, they might say. It's the consequences of your bad actions. It's the ramifications of those things that you experience here on earth. Um, and I obviously think there's an element of that that is true. It's like we are the ones who introduced hell into God's good creation through sin. Um, but uh, I, I mentioned this to you beforehand, you're a really good sport to to respond to a TikTok. So <laughs> I've been doing this on the podcast lately to give our audience sort of a, we want to model what it would look like to discern through some of the videos that you're going to see come down your social media news feeds um, on Instagram. A lot of the TikToks are on YouTube and also on Instagram. So you don't even have to be on TikTok to see them, but it's where a lot of this is is going on. So I've got a TikTok here where a woman is making a lot of claims about hell and what it is and who made it up and if it's real or if it's not real. And uh, then uh, Josh will get into kind of digging down into some of the details of, you know, if, if God kicks hell out of earth, where does it go? Uh, what is the future for evil? And uh, so let's take a look at this TikTok and then we'll discern through it. And then you can kind of add uh, some some thoughts to this as well. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the origins of hell. So, in the original Bible, written in Hebrew, hell was actually originally Gehenna, a place outside of the city where they would throw prisoners uh, and burn uh, bad people, right? So, flaming torment, that's where it comes from. When the Bible was then translated into Greek, we started to get a little bit more of the Greek mythology into the Bible context, and Gehenna was turned to Hades, the god of the underworld, the underground flaming place that the Greeks believed you went uh, after you died. How did we get from Gehenna to Hades to hell? Well, you only have to do is look to Norse mythology. The goddess Hel, H-E-L, was actually the goddess of the underworld in Norse mythology. The English translations come next where they added that extra L. So if you take Gehenna to Hades to hell to hell, that's where hell came from, my darling. And in fact, most modern depictions that we see and know of hell come from Milton's Paradise Lost, which is also a work of fiction. So why are so many people afraid of hell, a place that has never been discovered, never been substantiated, and comes from mythology? Well, that's because during the Middle Ages, when the church realized that they could control people with fear, they ran with the concept of hell to 
give people a punishment for not believing. Hell is a tool that is used to control people with fear. Hell is fictional. Hope this helps. All right, well, Josh, that uh, video has 70,000 likes on TikTok. I mean, I, I wanna make make sure our audience understands that these this, a lot of people might've heard that or watched that and thought, oh, that's just so out there. Nobody would believe that. But a lot of people get their theology from TikTok and Instagram, sadly. And I wanna make a couple comments um, before I throw it over to you, just to, as to how she characterized how we even got the Bible. Um, and and I, she, it's possible she just misspoke or didn't add enough information here, but the implication from the video is that the entire Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek and then into English, which is not exactly how that worked. The Old Testament certainly was written in Hebrew and parts in Aramaic. It was translated into Greek in the intertestamental period, and that's often referred to as the Septuagint. Although I don't know, Josh, if you're familiar with the video from uh, jo uh, Peter Williams from Cambridge, who he's got this really fascinating video about why he doesn't believe that the Septuagint is a real thing. And if anybody wants to go down a super nerdy and fun rabbit hole, you can go watch that video. Um, but, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, we refer to that Greek translation of the Old Testament as the Septuagint. Of course, then the New Testament was not originally written in Hebrew. It was written in Greek. So it wasn't like the New Testament was translated from Hebrew and then into Greek and then into English. So when we translate the Bible, you're translating the Old Testament from the Hebrew and Aramaic and then the Greek uh, the New Testament from the Greek. So I just didn't want anybody to be confused about that. But what do you think about her claims about hell and um, the mythologies that sort of made their way into that? <laughs> yeah, well, first off, like many bad ideologies, there are a few uh, truths uh, mixed in with a bunch of lies. You know? So right, right. Uh, a few things in there. And maybe to, you know, to take the, her very first one as an example. Uh, so it is true the term Gehenna uh, has an Old Testament history and backdrop. So maybe to go a little deeper, she said Gehenna is the Hebrew Bible. Gehenna is actually a Greek term itself. And so it's the dominant oh. New Testament term for hell, um, where she was saying it was Hebrew. So it's actually Jesus talks about Gehenna, James talks about Gehenna, the New Testament. Uh, that if, if you're reading your New Testament, you come across the word uh, hell. That's most often a translation of the Greek term Gehenna. Now, it is referring to a place in the Old Testament, the Valley of Hinnom. And really quick on that, so Ge is the Greek word for valley. Henna is a transliteration of Hinnom. And so this was an actual physical place located just outside Jerusalem's walls. Now, where she starts to kind of get off on, on this first part, get off base here, is that um, it wasn't prisoners. In, in the Bible, actually, it was famous as a location of child sacrifice. And so you can read in like places like Kings and Chronicles, and you read the prophets referring to this. And as I go into a lot more detail in my book, but in short, um, Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom became like the symbol for the prophets of how corrupt Israel had become. Of uh, The child sacrifice was like a symbol of how far their idolatry had gone, that they were sacrificing their children to these foreign gods, of how far their um, injustice had become. These were not just their kids, they were God's children. They were, yeah, and so they were committing these horrific acts. And so for the prophets, uh, Gehenna or the Valley of Hinnom became this, uh, like a real place outside Jerusalem's walls where the people would go outside the city, they would light the flames to foreign other, other gods, and they would sacrifice, murder their children. And God says in the prophets of Jeremiah, how could you ever do such a thing? Never would I have commanded such a thing. And then the hope of the prophets though becomes that one day God is returning as king. And when he comes back as king, he is going to kick the rebellion out of his city, out of Jerusalem, outside his kingdom. And where's he gonna send it to? It's gonna kick it back out to the Valley of Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, where the kind of wildfire started in the first place, right? And so, uh, so in the Old Testament pro prophetic kind of uh, backdrop, that Jesus in the New Testament are drawing upon, she's right that Gehenna refers to a real place, um, but she's wrong in saying that I just kind of got picked up and um, manipulated by later church and whatever else. Uh, it was actually a sign of, man, God's going to come and establish his kingdom, and he's kicking the rebellion outside the kingdom. It's going to go outside the city, outside of God's kingdom, this place. So there's that. You know, uh, I, I could nitpick a couple other things you mentioned, you know, but the, the thing that I would maybe focus on is that hey, it's the later church sort of has this power trip and jumps mm -hmm. on the 
hell to try and control people, manipulate people. Jesus talks about hell more than anyone else in the Bible, right? Like, and yeah. so you really have Jesus giving uh, some really severe warnings about, man, the gravity of sin, about uh, resisting and rebelling against God, of, of actually setting your life in opposition to God's goodness and his kingdom. Jesus gives the strongest warnings and he warns using this language of Gehenna, which yeah. again, he's drawing on this backdrop to go, I think the the, the storyline that Jesus is pointing us to is he's saying, hey, if you're giving your life over to sin and those things, God's a good king. He's coming back. He's going to establish his kingdom and that stuff is not going to fly. It's going to get you out. So get your life right with God. <laughs> get yeah, right, right with God. Because, right. you know, you, you know, you, you, yeah, you don't have forever. Like you don't know when, but he's coming back and his That's kingdom right. is going to come forward. And so if anyone, like it's really coming from, I think, a desire by the church historically to seek to be faithful to Christ and to the storyline of scripture, taking these themes seriously. Right. And I'll just make one final comment on that, that just after having studied deconstruction for the past year, one thing that we all need to always be aware of, and, and, and I'm trying to train my audience to watch for this, but notice that in most of the skeptical, the, cur the current modern kind of deconstructionist videos that are made against Christianity, they don't have the same sort of flavor as, say, like a Bart Ehrman or somebody who is actually... Um, affirming that objective truth exists. Like a skeptical scholar like a Bart Ehrman is not a postmodern. He believes there's an ob objective truth um, and that some of what at least can be known, and he just doesn't think Christianity is it. That's a different category than what we see with a lot of the deconstructionists who are motivated, uh, whether they realize it or not, by a postmodern rejection of objective truth, or at least that objective truth could be known, especially when it would come to religion and morality. So when it comes to religion and morality, when Christians make claims like hell is real, Jesus is the judge, sin is real, uh, in the mind of the deconstructionist, they're not engaging the factual value of what you've just said. They don't think those things are even possible for anyone to be able to claim to know them. So when you make a truth claim as a Christian like that, they're not engaging with what you've said. They're engaging with what your possible motivation could be for, for saying something like that, because they don't even think you could know that. So that's where truth claims in those arenas of religion and morality are seen as power grabs. And there you yeah. get the ending where the only sense she can make of why the church would possibly promote the doctrine of hell would be to seek to control, to keep their institution in place, to exert power over people, to scare them into obedience or something along those lines. And you, so always be looking for that. And this is for the audience here. Just, just always be looking for that when you are uh, analyzing something, look for the moral claim that's made or the, the assumption of the motivation of the person person, because um, I don't think that it would be possible to document that the church got together and was like, boy, you know, these people are like out of control. We got to scare them into obedience here, right? So it's it's something that's just assumed, and it's flowing out of that postmodern uh, type of worldview. All yeah. right, so... And, oh, yeah. I was going to say, if I could, you know, piggyback yeah, on that, this, like, I think the same critique could be pushed back, you know, for, for a lot of the deconstructionist kind of influencers, like that video is a perfect example where... Well, we could make the same claim of what she's doing of saying like, dude, she is picking and grabbing and misrepresenting and distorting because she wants to push forward her own truth claim that actually builds her a mini institution of her social media platform and gets That's her followers. Right. And so she's actually doing, it could be argued, the very thing that she's accusing the church of struggling doing, which church actually didn't historically do, but she is right. actually you know, like seeking to manipulate the facts and pull things in different directions and not really... Uh, representing things uh, with any kind of um, accuracy in order to craft her own narrative that's building her own sort of mini institution, social media institution mm -hmm. of her own platform on TikTok. Or, you know, and so yeah. there, there's an irony at play, it seems like, in how often uh, many of those who are building these massive platforms through misrepresenting Christianity and its history and all are in some ways doing the very thing that they're wrongly accusing 
others often are doing. Oh, that's a great point. Seriously, great point. Yeah, I'm glad you you popped in with that. Well, with the few minutes that we have left, um, I, I do want to uh, draw our the attention of our listeners and viewers to, uh, I, I think, it, I, can't, I can't remember off the top of my head, it might have been a two-part series, but it's at least one episode that we did with Dr. Michael McClyman on universalism. And so I definitely want to refer you to that. So we won't be able to go deep into that, but I do want to touch on universalism because I do think that is something that's catching on um, even among Christians who wouldn't maybe otherwise be progressive in other topics. And it can be very uh, appealing because it's sort of um, it's existentially comforting to people to like I even in my book, I said universalism you know, dot, 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 the way we would do it if we were in charge. But, you know, thankfully, we're not in charge. We don't have all the wisdom that God has, and we don't know the end from the beginning like he does, and we're not perfectly holy like he is. Um, But talk a little bit about what's wrong with universalism. And you kind of have the analogy, I'll lock you in the basement. Talk about that. And why does it misconstrue the nature of divine love and our heart and heart? Great. Definitely. Yes. So one of the analogies I use in uh, Skeletons, is, the book Skeletons, is if you think of the Gospels like the wedding proposal, where Christ is the groom, he's laying his life down at the cross saying, hey, be united with me, the imagery of come be a part of the church, be a part of my bride, like actually come be united with me forever in life forever. Uh, and if we reject that proposal, well, what options does God have? You know, and I, and I feel like there's a few exploring the book, but one is sort of, you know, marry me or I'll kill you. And I'd say mm. that's sort of the annihilationism option. You're like, right, marry right. me, come be united with me, accept the gospel, or I'm going to snuff you out. And while a lot of people uh, think that's maybe a more merciful option, I suggest it's actually not, you know, it's, I agree. it's actually, yeah. when you will look at it. But then with universalism, the analogy used there is um, that it's kind of like God saying, hey, marry me or I'll lock you in the basement. Meaning uh, many in the universalist kind of movement or camp or people who lean there, might accept hell, but they see it as kind of almost like a having a purging effect. God's going to put you there for a season, like locking you in the basement until you sort of learn to love him, you know? And I think some of the challenges there, one is that's not the way love works. You know, like, like coercion. If you think about someone who's abducted, right. And kind of held captive against their will, uh, that doesn't, induce love or there is sort of Stockholm syndrome, you know, where someone will fall in love with their captor or whatever. We'd all kind of look at it and go, that's unhealthy. That's not a good thing. Uh, because true love doesn't come from being coerced or punished or whatever. It's actually, uh, it comes from the inside out. It's not coerced from the outside in. Uh, and I also think it underplays the biblical depiction that we have of the hardened heart that mm. there's this gravity that we should take seriously that uh, we see throughout the biblical story that when we reject God and we rebel against him, we prefer our own ways over his, that there is a hardening of the heart that I think we can think of as like analogous to addiction, where it's like the further in you go, actually the harder it is to pull out, right? And so um, if, if you are living right now in a way that says, you know, you hear people say sometimes like, well, I'll get to God eventually, you know, like maybe when, when I'm older, you know, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll follow God or in the universalist position is sort of like, well, maybe a thousand years from now, you know, like some point down the mm-hmm. road, like I'll get to God. But I think that misunderstands the nature of the hardening of the heart, like addiction going like the further in you go, yeah. if you don't want God right now, that's a sign that you don't find him desirable. You don't find him good. And what makes you think that's going to change when his kingdom comes? I, you know, I think some people, maybe the, the implicit assumption is something like, um, you know, I think of my my kids. And let's say if one of my kids is kind of like saying to me, like, or to my, my wife, I'd say, Mom, I hate you. I hate you. Dad, I hate you. I hate you. And then we bring out ice cream on the table. And it's like, I love you, Dad. You know, I love you, Mom. <laughs> right. I want the goodies. And therefore, I'm going to say the things, right? You know, and, and I think for some people, that's kind of behind the scenes. Like, yeah, I don't want God now. But when the kingdom's there. And when all the goodies are on the table, then everyone's going to want him. And it's going, well, yeah, but then you're not really wanting the king. You're wanting the goodies, you know, and that's not, and God's not deceived. He won't be mocked. He knows the human heart. And so I I think there's a, in some, I think with universalism, it underplays the, it minimizes the reality of sin as like an addictive hardening heart of heart Mm -hmm. that gets worse and worse and more caved in on itself as time goes on. And I think it misunderstands the nature of love 
that how you know thinking that coercion or whatever is going to eventually lead to love. And third, I just say, man, there's a finality to God's judgment in Scripture. I have a whole other section yeah. in the book that goes into that. There's a depiction of God is calling out who we really are, what we really want, the final judgment, and uh, and there's a finality to the way that Christ talks about that, and that gets depicted that we should take seriously. Yeah. No, that's really good. And I would add something to it, too. I'd be actually curious to hear your thoughts on this as you were talking, because I personally think of all the versions of universalism, the locked in the basement one is probably the biggest challenge to orthodox theology because they kind of wiggle around some things. Oh, no, there is sort of this quasi punishment element to it. God will refine with, you know, this or that. But a couple of thoughts on that too, aside from, of course, what the Bible actually says, the finality of judgment. I mean, that's very clear in scripture. So universalism should not be on the table for Christians anyway. But let's say, you know, you get a little confused about it and you're like, well, that kind of makes sense. Um, as you mentioned, it underestimates the hardening of the human heart. And also it's, it, it also doesn't take into account the common grace that we're experiencing here on earth right now, right? So everybody on earth, even the most hardened atheist, benefits from God's goodness in creation and his common grace, right? The, uh, the atheist knows what love is because God exists and gives that kind of common grace to everybody else. And so um, the, the atheist isn't experiencing a world that uh, that is entirely separated from God's love and goodness. They're experiencing God's love and goodness in his creation, whether they acknowledge it or not, whether they realize it or not. And so even if you had a situation and let's just say theoretically that it could work theologically where God has this sort of like, um, you know, purging chamber or rehabilitation place, you know, before people would be ushered into his presence forever. Um, as you mentioned, with the hardening of the human heart, um, I think it was C.S. Lewis who posited that the door of hell is locked on the inside, not the outside. Um, what on earth would make us think that if people are experiencing their sin and their hardening of their heart not even in the context of God's common grace anymore, that they would ever even want to uh, be, you know, get out of that. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Am I, am I totally off base here? <laughs> no, totally. Yeah. Uh, one of the ways I, I look at it is just that um, in the language of, of freedom, that there's really two kinds of, there's freedom from and for. And often in America, you know, we tend to think of freedom as freedom from, like I'm freedom, I'm free to be free from God, free from others, free to just do what I want to do, be who I want to be. And the reality is that in the Bible, that's slavery, you know, like that's yeah. like being enslaved to yourself and your corrupted affections and desires. And so there is, this, I, I have a chapter, like you mentioned on kind of Lewis's idea in the great divorce of like the doors being locked from the inside. Um, the point being not, not that God isn't, God, you know, God is sovereignly judging and, and holding and all that. Um, but there is this other angle on, it's not against the human will. It's in, it's in alignment with, the will, you know, like our human rejection of and our desire for freedom from him, like that we at, at the root, as to the root issue at Plain Hell is that we want freedom from God. And um, yeah, and sometimes God's greatest judgment is giving us what we want. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Well, as we close out here, um, you know, let's end on a hopeful note because it's, it's been a heavy conversation. There's so much more. Recommend people uh, who are listening and watching uh, pick up uh, Josh's book, Skeleton in God's Closet. Um, I found it personally really helpful. But Josh, just as we close out here, you know, this is just like I mentioned at the beginning, an existentially tough issue to think through as Christians. I think even just the concept of eternity, whether good or bad, is difficult for our minds to, to wrap around. So what hope would you leave us with? What hope does the gospel offer? And why is all of this a necessary conversation to really understand the beauty of what God has offered us? Great. Well, I'd say, you know, the biggest thing I would really want to leave listeners with is that all of this arises because of God's goodness, not in spite of it or in contradiction to it. It's because God is good that he is on a mission to reconcile heaven and earth and bring back together what sin, death, and hell have torn apart. It's because God is good that he's going to liberate his capital, so to speak, of Jerusalem, to establish his kingdom on earth as in heaven and to remove and contain the destructive power of unrepentant sin. You know, and it's because God is good that he's, his question to us is not, hey, are you good enough to get into my kingdom? His question is rather, will you let me heal you? Like I've already gone all the way to the cross. Like I've taken, I've gone to hell and back for you. You know, I've taken the weight of your sin and all of that. I've taken the wrath, the punishment, all that. 
upon myself in Christ. Like Christ has taken that saying, now be united with me forever. Like let's take my perfection for your rejection. Like take my grace and goodness for your sin and uh, rebellion, you know? And, and so the beauty is like that this whole story and everything we've been talking about today, like we can take confidence in the goodness of God because that is what is driving where things are going. Well, I want to thank my guest, Joshua Ryan Butler. If you're interested in digging deeper into theology and exploring topics like hell and God's wrath, I want to recommend Southern Evangelical Seminary to you. I'm currently a student there. I love SES. They have been with me for years and years. I've audited classes there. I'm now taking classes for credit going for my philosophy certificate. Can't recommend them highly enough. SES.edu slash Elisa. You'll get a free little download book and you can check out all the different options for higher level education. That's ses.edu slash Alisa. Thanks so much for subscribing on YouTube. Be sure you get notified every time we release a new video. If you're listening on audio platforms, I know I always say it, but guys, it helps so much. You all have done such a great job rating and reviewing the podcast, which really pushes it into the news feeds of more people. Always helps if you share on social media, even if you just see it go by and you want to click like, put a little comment in there. It triggers the algorithms to let people know like this is interesting content that people want to know. Please send it via email to anybody who might be wrestling with this type of topic. And as we seek to pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. See you next time.